Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. This week on Podcast on the Brink, it is me and Alex spend some time talking about Indiana's performance in the NIT, talk about Romeo Langford uh, and you know kind of his situation with the back injury and some of the discussion about whether he you know should play in the NIT, whether he shouldn't play in the NIT, and then you know really get into some interesting discussions based on some takeaways that uh, Alex has had from some of the interactions that he's had with guys after the Big Ten tournament and the NIT where it's an open locker room and you can talk one-on-one. And I think some really interesting insights into Deron Davis, uh, a really interesting conversation about Devontae Green, <laughs> as we mentioned. You're probably going to want to cut the audio out and save it in case you need to uh, to use it against us. Uh, but it's, uh, it's in stark contrast to a conversation he and I had when I was up there in town uh, for the Michigan State game. So, uh, you know, look, none of us want to be talking about the NIT, But here we are, and Indiana won. Uh, And also, we present some interesting statistics. Interesting, maybe a little bit the wrong word. uh, Ominous statistics about number one seeds in the NIT that you're going to want to uh, listen to before you get too overconfident about Indiana's upcoming game against Arkansas. Anyway, all of that coming this week on Podcast on the Brink. Before we get to that, we have a new sponsor for this week. uh, Currently slated to just be a one-week sponsorship, but we're happy to have them. And that is DraftKings. And it's March And we all know what that means. It's tourney time. uh, And we have teamed up with our friends at DraftKings for a very special promotion, Brackets. This year, you can build your bracket for free just in time for the most electric period of college basketball. And with $64,000 on the line, here's how you can play. Step one, pick your teams. Step two, rack up points for each correct pick. Step three, get the most points and you win. The way it works is just go to dkng.co slash inside the hall that is dkng.co so not dot com but dot co and then forward slash inside the hall make sure that you get your brackets submitted by tip off on march 21st again that's dkng.co slash inside the hall must be 21 years or older to enter eligibility restrictions apply see website for details okay now here's my conversation with alex bozich All right, Alex. Well, last time we talked, we uh, we were hoping that this week's episode would be talking about the NCAA tournament. Uh, instead, Indiana in the NIT, and so we have an NIT game to discuss. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much on that game. Obviously, we broke it down on the post game show. Uh, you know, do want to spend a few minutes on it. But you know, one question that I want to ask you: You were there in the building last night, so I think one question when you know, when Indiana plays in an NIT game like this is how are the fans going to respond? What's the energy, the atmosphere going to be like? From all the reports that I've gotten, the total attendance number wasn't very big. It was 5,000 and change. But it sounds like the people who were there were really engaged and that it was actually a pretty good atmosphere given given the number of people, which is encouraging, I think. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I wrote uh, in five takeaways was, you know, it's it's an opportunity for fans who normally wouldn't be able to make a game. Um, obviously the, it's not part of a season ticket package and, and the interest in an event like this, a second tier event is not what it would be for even a, you know, a non-conference early season game against one of the dregs of college basketball. So yeah, it, it, you don't expect a big crowd. And it was, it was funny. I actually tweeted before the game that I thought there was something like 6,500 people there. And I, I guess I overshot because the, the final number that came out was 5,400 something. Uh, and so it, it actually seemed like more than that, which uh, it, it's, it's really hard to kind of gauge in assembly hall just because of, I don't know exactly what the capacity of the balconies are as opposed to the main level, but you know, the main level was full, probably about 60% of the way up on both sides, which is a pretty decent crowd. And, you know, I don't know how it looked on TV. I haven't had a chance to watch the game back. Not sure that I will. But uh, the sound, uh, you know, the crowd was into it. And 
more than anything else, I think you have to look at this as a, a positive just for the fact that, you know, I saw a lot of kids there and, and different people that probably wouldn't have otherwise had a chance to see the game. And to me, that was one of the biggest takeaways from just the whole, the whole thing. It's not, you know, when I talk to the players afterwards in the locker room, it's kind of an awkward question to ask, like, Hey, I know you're not excited. Uh, I, I know you're disappointed not to be in the tournament. So what's it like to play in this event? And most of them are pretty forthcoming and just in terms of admitting that, Hey, this isn't where they wanted to be, but they have to make the best of the situation. So same thing kind of goes for the fans. I mean, you know, it's, it's not kind of where you want the program that you root for to be, but you make the best of a situation. And I thought overall it was neat to see people that uh, otherwise wouldn't have got an opportunity uh, to take in a game to be there. If you do decide to rewatch the game, might I suggest that you fast forward through the first half? Not, 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 not a whole lot of positive things to watch there in the first half. Yeah. The second half, half much better. The first half was uh, just a, you know, I, I wrote this too, is basically, Looked like a team that didn't want to be there. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, I don't really. It's understandable. Blame them. I don't blame them necessarily. I mean, I looked at this going into the game the last three years in the NIT. Uh, obviously, there's there's 32 teams each year. Um, and only one uh, over the last three seasons, only one uh, number one seed has actually advanced to New York. So that kind of tells you the teams that are seated higher in this event. Uh, most of them are disappointed that they didn't make the tournament. Some of them pack it in. So I guess the encouraging thing was after the way they played in the first half, seeing them bounce back and, and respond uh, was was a good thing. We'll see how long they can kind of keep the that energy, that momentum going. Um, you know, they're going to probably play two solid teams these next two games. If, if, if they advance past Arkansas, maybe a team like Wichita State, Clemson. Uh, did Clemson win? I, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to look it up right now. Or I, th- I think Furman was the other team that could possibly uh, be an opponent. But but more or less, I mean, it's it, this is an event that you definitely have to want to be there if you're going to advance. And um, we'll, we'll see uh, more or less how, how long Indiana wants to stay in this thing. Yeah, Clemson won. They will take on the winner of Furman-Wichita State. And then Indiana, if they yeah, win, the would take on the winner at, like, of that game. This team that they played last night was, what, 260-something in Ken Palm? I think Furman and uh, Clemson are like top 60-ish type teams. So it's not like they're going to be playing like an awful team. Same thing with Arkansas. Yeah. I think there's something in the 50s. So, you know, it, it, coming up, you know, if, if, they're, if they have another repeat performance in the first half, um, I don't know that they're necessarily going to be able to get away with that again against one of these upcoming teams. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, to your point, I looked at the same numbers. You go back the last three years, number one seeds are 10 and two in the first round. And then in the second round is where a lot of them fall off. Number one seeds that advance to the second round are two and eight, losing by an average score of 6.75 points. Uh, only one of those teams. Two of those teams, one made the quarterfinals, one lost in the title game. That was Valpo back in 2016. So, you know, and, and I guess my hypothesis for that would be, you know, the teams that are the one seeds are probably, they're disappointed they didn't make the NCAA tournament, you know, because they were right there on the bubble. A lot of them are playing, you know, eight seeds that aren't very good, probably teams like a St. Francis that are ranked in the 200s. You can get by without an A game, maybe without your B game. But then in that second round matchup, you're, you're going to be facing another good team. And you're probably facing, in a lot of cases, you look at it, you're facing a big conference team that's actually happy to be in the NIT because they didn't really have hopes of the NCAA tournament. So they're happy to have some tournament play. And so, you know, it's going to be interesting. Arkansas, it appeared, gave a real inspired effort against Providence, really played well in that game. They don't have Daniel Gafford, you know, so you've got some guys that are in some different roles and maybe energized a little bit by having some more opportunity that they don't have with the big guy out there. Not to say that they're better without Gafford, but it's a team with a little bit of a different mindset. And I think in a tournament like this, the approach and the mindset and the enthusiasm that you bring to it can make all the difference. And that's what we saw from Indiana last night was a team, like you said, didn't seem like they really wanted to be there in the first half. I get it. I'm encouraged by the fact that they turned it around. And I guess the hope now is that, and Archie kind of alluded to this, you know, it's like you, you kind of broke your sweat in the tournament a little bit. You get past that, you know, that first little lull, 
They played better in the second half, although the defense, you know, still wasn't very good. Now you have to hope that that carries over. But I have to say, when I looked up the data <laughs> earlier this morning and saw what number one seeds do in the second round, it made me a little bit concerned. So this Indiana team definitely is going to have to bring a better approach to that game from the beginning. Perhaps that it's a team that they already faced this year and that essentially knocked them out of the NCAA tournament. Because if Indiana had won that game, had another road game, another road win, they're almost assuredly going to be in the tournament, given how the committee looked at things. Maybe you can pitch that as a way to get this team focused from the tip. That said, this has been a team that's had trouble focusing for 40 minutes anyway, so it would not be surprising if their focus ebbs and flows even in that game. Just have to see. Yeah. One of the things that I didn't get a chance to listen to the post game show last night, Jared, but I'm curious from your perspective, um, how important is it? Do you think, and you, you know, you have a chat going on with fans after the games and you hear from a lot of people, how important do you think it is um, from the fan base perspective that Indiana advances in this event? Do you think people actually care? Do you think they want the season to be over? And, and do you think there's any value long-term um, from going on a run in the NIT? Because I'm, I'm looking at a team like Penn State last year. Obviously, the situation is a little different uh, and that they lost Tony Carr, but they won the NIT last year, and it didn't really seem to have any carryover effect. So I'm curious just from from – kind of what you've gathered from the fan base and your own personal thoughts do you think there's any value in the nit or is this really just kind of going through the motions i think there was definite value in averting an absolute disaster right and if they had lost that game last night or played in the second half like they did in the first half that would have been a disaster and look like i feel like you've got a segment of the fan base that has already checked out you know, because they didn't make the NCAA tournament, they don't respect the NIT, they don't see it as anything meaningful, so they're checked out. And if you make a run, you might be able to pull some of those people back in, but whatever, those people have made their choice, fine. I don't agree with it, but whatever, I'm not going to spend a lot of time arguing with them right now. But what you had last night in the arena and what you had in the people that were there in our post-game chat are, you know, the loyal ride-or-die type people. And those are the people that just want to see the team improve every game and play hard and give an honest effort, you know? And I know during our halftime report, that was probably one of the most dejected and concerned halftime reports I've ever done because they, I mean, it looked like we were on the verge of a disaster. So I think it's really good just that they averted that because if that's what takes you into the offseason, which is already shaping up to be a very uncertain, very pensive offseason... That's just not what you want. That would have been getting off on the wrong foot to that offseason. So now what I think you have is at least an opportunity, if you can you know, win a few of these games, to have a little positive momentum going into it. And a little bit of, hey, you know, a couple times this season, Archie kind of rallied the troops when the chips really seemed down. Doesn't excuse everything that happened before it, but at least you end with a little bit of positive momentum. And I think from a player standpoint, you have an opportunity for guys like Al Durham to maybe build some momentum and build some confidence. You know, a guy like Devontae Green, can he keep stringing together positive performances? You know, can some of the young guys get in there? And, and, and of course, you know, getting a chance to see Juwan hopefully go out on a high note and hopefully see Romeo play again. So I think there's a lot of ways that it could be meaningful. And any time that you can compete for and possibly win a championship, even if it's the NIT, that means something. There's nothing that could happen in this tournament that redeems the season. It's always going to be looked at as a disappointment. But you can build something positive, some positive momentum. And I think for this program, where there was so much momentum last offseason and, shoot, heading into Christmas this year, you know, it just hit a thud. And to just get a little bit of that back going with on-court results, I think is important. So, you know, you averted the disaster. You know, if you go out and play well against Arkansas and you lose, I think that would be really disappointing. But it would just kind of be, all right, well, that's how this season ended. And okay, let's go on to the offseason. It wouldn't be the absolute disaster that losing that last game would be. But I think with some of your loyal people, you can build back a little bit of goodwill and enthusiasm if you go on a run and you know try your best and see the guys kind of come together. So I think there's something to be said for that. And I think the energy and the enthusiasm that you saw in Assembly Hall last night is indicative of that. There's a lot of people that are still here with this team that just want to see them go out and finish things in a positive way. And, you know, I think if they can do that, the program will be rewarded with at least some momentum from 
the people who kind of love it the most if that if that kind of makes sense yeah i think the real interesting thing about saturday and and i went into last night thinking that they were going to play again thursday or friday not saturday the the real interesting thing about saturday is going to be and I, i didn't pick up on this until last night when there was a bunch of student media in the after in the post game talking about it but and this was before i knew it was saturday but there was some talk of well i hope it's not saturday because obviously you got the ncaa tournament going on people are going to want to watch that that's a given but any day they would have played between thursday and sunday you had the case but also saturday you have little 500 qualifications going on in bloomington and you also have the state finals at bankers life Fieldhouse in indianapolis so you kind of wonder and obviously this 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 whole event is made for TV, right? It's, it's it's ESPN wants to fill some gaps in its programming, and that's what this is all about. Um, but it'll be interesting to see the how, how um, the attendance is. And the other thing I'll say about last night that was cool, at least just from the perspective of St. Francis, this is the program that was disappointed not to make the tournament. Uh, they they won their their league in the regular season, but to see them embrace this opportunity, they brought their band, they brought cheerleaders. That's awesome. Um, it was it was you know, it's for them it, it meant something and um it, it's probably something that that some of those guys will talk about forever. Hey, I got to play in the NIT at at, at IU and it, it, maybe you know, it's 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 something you can look at and as an IU fan and say, you know, I guess it could always be worse. Like if that's kind of the pinnacle for your program playing in the NIT at IU, then, um, you know, obviously that's not, not nothing to, to be too excited about, but I thought it was cool just kind of how their, their school embraced it and, and how excited they were uh, to play in it. And, you know, given how well the smaller schools have done in the NIT in terms of advancing and, and, all the discussion that there's too many teams playing in the postseason, and how you know some of these major conference teams, you know, if they don't make the tournament, maybe they shouldn't play. Maybe in the future, the NIT should look at trying to get more of these sw- smaller school teams uh, in in the in the field, especially if they're going to embrace it like this. Because um, obviously, for Indiana, it's ho hum afterthought event, but uh, this school, uh, St. Francis, was genuinely excited to be there, which I thought was was neat to see. Yeah, it was really cool to see. Uh, I want to talk with you about Romeo. I want to talk with you about the experience that you've had the last couple of games of actually having an open locker room to be able to talk with the players. Before we get to that, though, uh, this episode of Podcast on the Brink brought to you by our friends at Home Field. And at homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. Home Field was started by an IU grad, and all Home Field apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And now that it's March, Home Field has you covered for tournament season, whether it's NCAA tournament season or NIT tournament season that you're following. Find your favorite vintage IU basketball apparel from Home Field and wear it proudly as IU survives and advances. And don't forget to use the promo code BRINK at checkout for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. And I do want to make note you know they've added a bunch of new items. So we've talked a lot about the the tri blend fleece hoodie with the bison logo, which when we were up in Bloomington, I saw a ton of them, and I know a lot of people have ordered that. Well, they now have a t-shirt version of that. So as the weather turns and you want to keep wearing that cool logo and that comfortable material, they've got that for you. Uh, the Indiana sh- uh, really cool little shoe design, they've got that. Um, I think in a, now a sweatshirt version. So they've added some new stuff at homefieldapparel.com. So if you haven't been there in a while. Make sure that you go homefieldapparel.com. And again, don't forget to use the promo code BRINK at checkout for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. Homefield, wear one for the team. Let me ask you real quick about Romeo. That was obviously a big topic of discussion last night. You know, he doesn't play, has the back spasms. You know, seemed like people wanted to kind of read into it, whatever they wanted to read into it. Like, is there any reason right now that we shouldn't give him the benefit of the doubt that what has been stated is what is the truth, which is that he wants to play. He'll play if he's healthy. He's got some, you know, some back spasms. He wouldn't have played if it was an NCAA tournament game. And they're just going to take it day by day and see when he's ready. I mean, I, I, I understand why people kind of spin their own things on it and view it the way that they want to. But as I look into it, I just don't see any reason to not give him and the program the benefit of the doubt that they're being straight up about this right now. Is there anything I'm missing? Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree with you. And I've. It was funny. Somebody tweeted last at me last night. Um, 
when it was announced that he or I tweeted that he wouldn't play and somebody tweeted at me like um something about how everyone responded to Kravitz the other day for what he wrote and and I was like I didn't really say I didn't tweet anything about Kravitz's column. I didn't have any response to it because I was of the mindset of uh as far as I've known Romeo going back, if it's a situation where he can play, he's gonna play. If not, he's not gonna play. And Furthermore, if indeed he decided that he didn't want to play in this event because he's going to the NBA and he doesn't want to risk further injury, personally, I would have no problem with that because if we're all being honest with ourselves about this event, which I think you know we've kind of alluded to here, this is, this is not what you come to college to play in, right? When you're recruited, you talk about going to play in the NCAA tournament. Now, I'm not advocating for anybody to quit on their team um but i also am saying that this is somebody with a tremendously bright future ahead of them an opportunity to go make millions tens of millions potentially hundreds of millions of dollars and you know if if something were to happen in a game like this where he was injured and put his future in jeopardy it would be very unfortunate so that's that's a decision that only he can make with his family whether or not he's going to play as as far as what the injury is, I do believe that his back, he does have a back issue. Uh, he left the Ohio State game, which was pretty much a do or die situation for Indiana's NCAA tournament hopes. He went back to the locker room, and there's no reason that we shouldn't take what the program is saying at face value at this point. But that's kind of a separate discussion for me uh, uh, as to whether he actually should play. And I think there's cases to be made for him playing, and I think there's cases for him to be made for him not playing. And that's a decision that only he and his family can make. And Whatever that decision is, uh, should be respected. And, you know, I've, Romeo to me has given everything he's had this whole season on the court. And, um, if I were advising him personally, uh, if he's comfortable playing, he should play. If he, if he's not, then, and that's his decision to make. And I think everyone should support him regardless. Yeah, I would say to that, I mean, in terms of Kravitz's article, I did respond to that article and responded harshly to it. Not necessarily because I think it's wrong for him to give his opinion. That's what he's paid to do. But because, once again, he painted IU fans with a broad brush of being disappointed with Romeo this season. And I just don't think that's true. I think there is a certain segment of the fan base that was never going to be satisfied with what Romeo brought unless it was a Final Four and maybe the greatest freshman season in school history. And Romeo didn't live up to that very high bar, which... You know, given the hype, seemed kind of fair as a ceiling expectation early in the season. That's fine. But I think most fans have understood the challenges of this season, appreciated the good things that that he has brought, and had kind of a, a fair, balanced view of it, where even if they're a little bit disappointed that he didn't reach the ceiling of those expectations, they're appreciative that it's one of the best freshman seasons we've ever had. And I get really, really annoyed when you just see statements like, you know, just painting all IU fans with a broad brush. So I can't stand that. And that that's why I re- reacted harshly to that article. But what I would say is I agree with you that he and his family need to make the decision if he's going to play or not. And they, you know, it's a it's an important decision. And I would respect the decision either way. But, you know, there's an extra level of appreciation that I think all IU fans and, and, and you know anybody would naturally have if you see him come back and play in an NIT game where it's like, you know what, man, I'm in the trenches with this program and he is too to the point where he would potentially risk a little bit of that future to play in this game because he wants to be there for his program and the teammates. So it's not like it would, if he doesn't play, it would take away. But I do think there's kind of that it's that it's like an opportunity for him to just solidify it a little more to like take a next step where it's like, man, I really appreciate that. He never quit on this season with the team, you know? So, so I would love to see him come back. Cause I just, I enjoy watching him play basketball and, and you know, however this team can finish, you know, with a positive this season, I would love to see it. So, but I, I, yeah. I just, I, I don't think there's any reason to not give him the benefit of the doubt, given everything that we've seen from him this year and what's been stated publicly. Just the whole the whole the whole thing's interesting because the other day, you know, Daniel Gafford just announces that he's going pro, he's not gonna play. And, you know, there's I think Jeff Goodman said this is the right decision. And then last night Romeo doesn't play. I think Sam Vicini, who we both like a, a whole lot, said, you know, this is kind of the right call that he's not playing. 
my whole problem with this whole kind of debate discussion is whether or not guys should play in the NIT, you know, and whether they should play in bowl games in college football. It's, it's not, there's no right or wrong answer to these situations. These are complex situations. These are yeah. obviously dependent on everyone's situation is different. And so I, I guess my problem with the whole debate, like I, I haven't really given, I'm not going to give a take on Twitter. Like Romeo should definitely play if, if he's healthy or he's quitting on his team if he doesn't play. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's the NIT. So I'm not going to like get worked up over over it one way or the other. My whole problem is like everyone has like their opinion on Twitter about this and they're like so entrenched in it that they're unwilling to hear the other side. And <laughs> yeah, there's well, no, welcome, there's welcome no, to public discourse in 2019. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's that. It and sucks. that's, that's one reason why it's just, there's no way to win an argument about this because you're going to yeah. have your people who are like, he is on scholarship, but I, you, he deserves to give them everything he's got. And then you're going to have your other people as well. He, kind of like where i'm at is like you know what if he's not 100 percent, he probably shouldn't play because you know no one's gonna remember uh i I mean we we might remember in the in the immediate future but for the most part you know if he doesn't play i don't think it's gonna like tarnish his legacy with iu fans people are gonna remember that he came to iu at a pretty difficult time for the program he was a recruit that Indiana in many ways after what happened at Louisville had to get, he came, things didn't go as expected, but when somebody carries themselves like he did on the court, you know, all the things that he did off the court, appreciate those things and don't think about if he makes it a a selfish, a quote unquote selfish decision for his family that he doesn't want to play. Don't judge him for it because you're not in his shoes and it's, 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 it's up to him really. So I I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think there's a, you know, there's both side. There's two sides to the story, and I, I'm confident that whatever decision uh, is made um, by him, whether he plays or not, or not again, is going to be the right decision for him, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, and and I do agree with you. I mean, if he's hurt, and certainly if he risks any further injury, he shouldn't play. But that I think that goes for all these guys because you know, like if Al Durham is hurt and could risk further injury, he's an important piece for next year. So we shouldn't risk him playing either. So I, I you know, I I completely agree with that. So let me let me ask you this because we did talk about this a little bit on the post game show last night. This team is better with Romeo Langford. They have a better chance of getting to New York with Romeo Langford. But with him out, it does present an interesting opportunity for a guy, and in particular, I think, for a guy like Al Durham to spread his wings a little bit. Because one thing that I've noticed, I think we've talked about this before, is you know, when Al and Romeo are on the court together, Romeo is obviously you know one of the best finishers in college basketball, one of the best at getting to you know to the lane. So you're going to run more things for him and give him opportunities to do that. He needs a guy like Al Durham to space the floor to help open things up. You're not often seeing Al Durham get opportunities to take the ball to the bucket as much because Romeo isn't the same kind of floor spacer and he defers more to Romeo. And I think for you know a lot of reasons that you know probably most of us in his shoes would. But when Romeo's off the court, I feel like we see a little bit more aggressive Al because he becomes the best guy at taking it to the basket and finishing and drawing contact. And I thought we saw some of that last night. Now, granted, the defense that was being played last night was Swiss cheese, sieve, you know, whatever analogy that you want to use. So you or I probably could have made a drive to the basket. Okay, probably not, but (laughs) certainly a guy like Al Durham could. But, you know, I wonder if you, you know, because again, you know, you, you try and take these performances and project them forward. For a guy who's going to be so important to this team next year as an upperclassman, I could see, you know, if Al gets some more opportunities as a scorer, if Romeo's not going to be there, I could see that being somewhat beneficial for him in terms of growing his confidence and getting, you know, ending the season with a flourish of production that might help him going into the offseason as he gets ready to assume more of a leadership role as a junior. It, do any do you place any credence on that at all? Yeah, I don't necessarily look at it as just an Al Durham thing, though. I look at it as also Deron Davis and Devontae Green because I'm looking kind of at the roster for next season. This is one thing I talked to Deron about uh, in the locker room last night. If you go on our YouTube channel, there's some sit-down type of interviews that we don't normally get access to. But Deron is is such an engaging guy and fun to talk to. But I, I asked him point blank kind of, you know, I, I, I said, you know, the season's not over yet, but, kind of what 
is your mindset going into this off season? And, you know, is it, you know, assuming a role, a leadership role. And he, he admitted that it's something he's already thinking about going into next season. So I think for him, for Al Durham and for Devonte Green, uh, specifically, even Justin Smith to an extent too, you know, th- these are going to be the upperclassmen of next year's team and anything that they can do uh, in terms of just having more time together as teammates and kind of building more camaraderie going into the off season, I think is going to be a positive, but Al Durham, I thought played last night really well. It was just, aggressive in terms of how he attacked the rim just look to me you know he hadn't I don't think he had scored in double figures yet in a game this month and for him to go out and have a career high 22 points I mean that's something to feel good about and hopefully something he can build on here going forward but I I don't think it's just an Al Durham thing I think anytime you have you know these guys have gone now through two seasons where they didn't get to where they wanted to be um you know, once this, you know, whatever they can get out of these games, I think is great. But I think the real um, test of kind of what's going to happen going forward is is what are the what are these guys going to do once the season ends to make sure this doesn't happen again next year. You brought up Duran. Let me ask you about him because I thought I really thought last night was a curious performance from him, and there were some kind of odd quotes from Archie Miller in the post game. You know. This game was tailor made for Duran to dominate it. I mean, this is one of the worst, you know, teams in terms of post defense. They, you know, their starting center weighed like 195 pounds. I mean, they, you know, this should have been a game where he really dominated, didn't in the first half, and then didn't play at all in the second half. And, you know, Archie made some comments after the game that was essentially, you know, Duran didn't look good tonight. He hasn't looked good for the last few days. Um, and, you know, he kind of, he made another comment later about, you know, a guy who got the ball in the post but wasn't ready to go up strong with it. And it's clear that he was talking about Duran. So the comments from Archie, they didn't sound to me like a guy who was saying he didn't look good from an injury perspective. It sounded like Archie was disappointed with Duran's mindset and unwillingness to want to go out there and dominate, which is kind of odd for a guy that we've seen be a real kind of, you know, competitive catalyst for this team. And really, when he gets in there, has really looked to you know, take the ball strong in the, in the post and be really confident and assertive with it. What sense did you get from talking to him? Like, is is this something where maybe he is like not feeling quite well physically or was just, just an off night for him? It was, it was just a kind of a curious performance from him. I thought, yeah, you can go watch the, the video. It, It does seem to me that he's, um, not physically where he wants to be still and may still be struggling. Uh, he talked a little bit about just kind of the lingering effects of having the injury that he did and not necessarily the Achilles bothering him, but when you compensate for something like that so much, it can affect other areas of your body. And and I I think this offseason is very pivotal for Duran from a health standpoint and a mindset standpoint because there was times this season where if Indiana could have had him on the court, I think he would have been able to change some games that they lost. And Archie Miller's comments last night almost kind of, you know, if you kind of connect the dots, it's almost like he's saying, you know, this is something we're going to need going forward, the guy to kind of be engaged and kind of be that junkyard dog that we need play through these things. And so Duran, I think, is a guy that's going to meet that challenge head on, but if I was to go into the off season and make a list on, you know, there's obviously everybody has things to work on and every off season for all of these guys is going to be important. But if I was ranking importance of, you know, who was it most important for on this team to have a great off season, Deron Davis would be one, a one B one, whatever. If you want to put him at the top of the list, he's the guy. And I think it's important that he stay healthy. And this is one thing I talked to him about last night a little bit was, Hey, when he came in, remember, when he came to IU, he arrived later than all of his other freshman teammates. If you remember that, Jared, he didn't I get do. there until August. Last he had off some season, academic work to finish up. Right. right. Last off season, he was basically just rehabbing, didn't get to do everything. Uh, he told me that this off season, he's actually going to go home for a little bit, um, and kind of he, he described it as kind of getting a mental break and just kind of recharging the batteries for a couple weeks and then come back and and kind of get get going, but. You know, it's it's going to be fascinating to try, and it and we're never we're not going to have the answer. The, the the thing about all these off seasons is when we get to media day in the fall, all we're going to hear about is so and so had a great off season and everything's great. This is the thing, you know. And NFL training camp opens. You know, I love my team. NBA best shape of his life. Exactly. 
we're not going to start to get those answers until you know November and December. But if he's not in the best shape of his life, then I think in a lot of ways you can look. You're going to we're going to look back on his career and just say, what a guy, you know, what a talented player that really never really reached the full potential. So I hope for his sake that he does have a great off season and is able to end his career on a much higher note than he has so far. So when I was up in Bloomington, do you recall the conversation that we had before the Michigan state game about Devonte green? <laughs> it was, let me just say it was a critical conversation about Devonte green. And I think it was fairly critical given that he was coming off four straight games of you know, single digit points. He had played 11 minutes in the double overtime game against Wisconsin, you know, and just hadn't been producing, didn't seem to really be bought into the team concept. Do you know what's happened ever since that conversation, Alex? Devontae Green has scored in double figures every game since then. He has 20 assists to eight turnovers. He's made three threes in four games. He's been, I mean, if not the the best and most consistent player on Indiana over that stretch, certainly one of them. I mean, it's been a real turnaround for him. Somewhat similar to what we saw kind of toward the end of last season, you know, where he really strung together some of these games. You know, he's now up over 40% from three-point range, shooting 41.6% for the season from three-point range. You know, he's got the highest assist rate of his career now, really starting to do some of the things that I think we've wanted from him. Heck, on the postgame show last night, Coach was like singling him out for criticism, and he's always frustrated with Devontae. So my question to you is, what are we to make of this? What of this is real that we can take into the offseason and project forward as a guy who maybe is, you know, kind of getting ready to embrace leadership and consistency as a senior? Or... Is it just kind of a thing where we need to enjoy this right now and just take it game by game with him? Because it, I mean, it, you know, you look at his game logs and just, you know, kind of go back in your memory Rolodex of the games. I mean, it is a really stark contrast from those four or five games prior to Michigan State and the game since. It has seemed like a different player. To what do you attribute that and how much are you buying into it slash trusting it? You may want to save this audio because. It's either going to be one of my worst takes ever or one of my best takes ever. But I think this is a turning point for Devontae Green. Um, Just from talking to him after the Big Ten tournament and last night, he just seems like something seems different about him. Like he's taking things more seriously. I don't know what changed for him from a mental standpoint. And... (laughs) When I asked him last night just about kind of the ups and downs of the season and kind of being criticized, his face, it was almost like he acknowledged and his facial expression was, you know, I know that this season hasn't been what I wanted it to be, but I'm I'm trying to make the best of it now and trying to head in the right direction. Um, a lot of guys could get defensive, I think, at a question like that. And I thought he did a great job of, and, and I wasn't critical with what I asked him, but I was basically like, you know, from a mental standpoint, when you're having, when you're going through all these ups and downs, how do you handle that? And he he answered the question, and I I, I just think the talent is such that he's not a guy you can afford to give up on because as we've seen, when he, when you can bottle up this good Devonte Green, and in, in some ways it's similar to good Troy Williams and bad Troy Williams, right? That's something that IU fans know good and well. The, the old light switch. Uh, gift that Karna Kuzier likes to <laughs> post on Twitter yes. uh, for some of these guys. But I think Devontae is, you know, and I'm not saying he's not going to have times when he's going to revert to maybe some poor performances, but I, I do I do look at this as a potential turning point for him. And um, I, I think he's important going forward. Um, the, the one thing I will say is I, I don't think that he should play point guard very much, if at all, you know, going forward. I think, I think he's the, the assisted turnover numbers have been good lately, but there's a comment that's like always stuck in my head going back to when I wrote his freshman focus piece before he arrived on campus, talking to his high school coach. I asked him specifically just about Devontae's fit. And this, this is stuck in my mind ever since that he basically said, Devontae is not a point guard. He's a scorer. He's a guy that can create for others, but he's best when he's, wired to score and I, and I are when he's given the opportunity to score. And I think 
kind of what we've seen lately is he's he's been given a little bit more freedom to take some shots now he's not always going to make the best decisions but he can carry a team when he's playing with confidence and I think getting confidence from the coaching staff and getting confidence from his teammates I think can really propel him into bigger things so he, he he's a guy that is polarizing I think in a lot of ways for the fan base you have your people who think for whatever reason, he's never going to figure it out. Um, but I'm kind of in the different camp where I, I think that there is potential for him to really play a big role, not only in the rest of the season, but but going forward next season. I think he's, I think he's a guy you want on the team next year, and I think he's a guy who's capable of having a really good final year in Bloomington. No doubt about it. I mean, you you've got to have upperclassmen guards to succeed in college basketball, and him getting it is so important for next year's team. And I think it's also, you know, having Rob Finnessy, I think will really help that because now, you know, trying to rely on Devonte green to kind of be a steadying presence in the backcourt, that is a losing proposition. It's not going to happen. It, it, and the Troy Williams comparison right. is a good one. Like you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily count on Troy Williams to be your rock of consistency. Right. But if you had other guys around him that were going to kind of bring it every game and make good decisions, and he could kind of flourish in spots and be unleashed, he w- he seemed much more comfortable. And we're seeing that with Devontae. And I think, you know, when you have a guy like Rob Finnessy with his mindset, which look, Rob Finnessy's been up and down too as a freshman, but he projects as a guy who, as he gets older, will be able to be more consistent in his performances. And I think Al Durham shows some of that mentality where you always know what kind of effort you're going to get from Al Durham. And I think Devontae, you know, he can slot in there now as a guy who can certainly be a consistent scorer because he's got that ability and we're certainly, you know, we're going to need that shooting. And and I think he has been much steadier to his credit the last five games. Yeah, I, It's a silly thing. But I was really impressed last night, like final minute of the game when Jake Forrester and, and Clifton Moore got in the game and, you know, Devontae had the ball. He was still out there. And there were a couple spots where he could have forced a shot. And I feel like three weeks ago, he would have forced a shot, but he kept his dribble and was you, like, you could tell he was committed. I'm getting the ball to Jake or Clifton. And he got it to Jake and Jake ended up getting a dunk. And like that little thing showed something. So I, I agree, like save this audio. This may end up being, and believe me, this is a stark contrast to the conversation that we had before the Michigan State game, just letting you all know. Uh, but I think it's earned, and I think you know you might be right. It may really be a turning point, um, and I think that note that you mentioned from his coach, that really seems to match up kind of with what we've seen. So Yeah, and I, th- and I think the most important thing that any coaching staff can do is put guys in the best position to succeed. And if we're looking forward to next year's roster, Rob Finnessy as as your starting point guard with Devontae Green as a guy who can shoot off of the wing, uh, you know, as a catch and shoot guy off drives or whatever. I think that can be a strength of a strength to this team. Now, I don't know if he can shoot 41% on threes again. Maybe he can shoot better. Maybe he has a huge offseason, but I, I think you got to put him in a spot where he can be successful. And the other thing I'll say about Devontae Green is they don't win either Michigan State game, in my opinion, without him. Um, some of the the work he did defensively at times, and Rob Finnessy had a good part of it too against Cassius Winston. But Devontae Green, especially in the first Michigan State game, pestered the ever living you know what out of Cassius Winston. And so I agree with you. Having seniors is important to winning. And as much as people don't want to hear, well, it's going to take time to get old, but. Um, you know, if if you if 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 you're if you're losing guys before they exhaust their eligibility, I mean, you, you you're losing a lot of experience. And Devontae Green's been through a ton in his career in Bloomington, and I would be shocked if he doesn't want to, you know, come back next year and see things through and kind of go out on a much higher note. He he just seems to me like a guy who has a bit of a chip on his shoulder and is going to want to, you know, be remembered as the guy who went out and and, and was successful in his final year and, and in many ways I think he's been successful as a whole this year you know he's been up and down I think if he can kind of be more consistent uh, have a more clearly defined role going in the next season I, I think he can be absolutely huge so save the tape um, maybe maybe don't <laughs> save the tape but we'll see um, did anything else stand out from either the Big Ten tournament or you know the I, th- this is I love this time of year for so many reasons but because 
you know, you guys were able to get in there and talk with these guys one on one. I wish I've you know said this so many times. I wish you know Indiana had a different policy and would allow that all the time because I think it would be good experience for these guys. And I think you can, as fans, you learn so much more about them. And the more you learn about these guys, I think the more natural empathy you have for them when you actually hear them talk and hear them answer questions. So, anything else kind of insightful from your ability to talk with these guys one on one after games? Well, last night it was. Out. Yeah, last night. It was more or less the the thing that kind of stood out to me was, and maybe nobody admitted this in words, but just the expression on some of their faces. I mean, there was genuine disappointment for these guys that they that they were in the NIT rather than the NCAA tournament. So, for anyone who has you know advanced the narrative on social media that some of these guys have checked out, they don't care. I don't think that's the truth at all. I think these guys do care. I think they realize that this season as a whole has been a huge opportunity missed. Um, you could just see it talking to Justin Smith, kind of the look in his eyes when I asked him about it. Uh, same thing with, uh, with the Ron, you know, all of them. I, and I think overall you're right. I mean, there's, you just learn so much more about these guys when you can get them in a one-on-one setting where they're not up on a podium and everyone's asking the same questions and everyone's getting the same responses. If you can, the more I think that any program, and this is not just IU because this is all across college sports where the access is limited, but anything you can do to kind of humanize these guys and let the fan base actually get to know them a little bit. I, I think, it's a good thing because a lot of times these guys are just viewed by the stat sheet and what they do on a game. You know, if somebody has a lot of turnovers, they're defined by that in the game. But these are, to me, guys who have represented the program well on and off the court. And, um, you know, I, I think just coming, the thing that's come through the most just from talking to them, I mean, these are, these are good, good guys uh, that, that want to be successful. I think they realize that this season didn't go. Um, like they wanted it to, but uh, I'll I'll be interested to see how they respond in the off season and how they carry kind of this sour taste in their mouth as uh, as they go into the year three of the Archie Miller era. So that's that's more more or less my takeaways. Yeah, year three of the Archie Miller era. That is uh, going to be a lot of talk about that in the off season. It's going to be going to be interesting. But hopefully, we have a few weeks before we before we have to get to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because there's going to be so many questions that we want answers to that aren't going to come <laughs> until the season starts. So I think it's going to make kind of yeah. a frustrating one. L- l- last note about last night. Um, we talked about this on the post game show that I th- I was. I think you can you can always criticize a coach when a team comes out with a poor mindset because you know the coach is responsible for how the team approaches a game. But I was. And I haven't been impressed at times this year with how Archie has necessarily navigated Indiana in games, at times being too stubborn, at times not wanting to call a timeout, this, that, or the other, you know, whatever. It's easy to have these judgments from a thousand miles away as you watch a game. But man, I thought he was really on point last night with navigating the team through a predictable malaise early in the game. You know, he called a timeout right away when it was 7 2. They immediately went on a 9 0 run. You know, I don't know if him getting a technical before halftime had anything to do with sending a message to the team. You know, it certainly seemed like he was upset with the call, and rightfully so. But, you know, that momentum of his anger certainly seemed to carry into the locker room. And then we heard about, you know, Ed Schilling having some comments and, uh, you know, and some other guys. And and Archie even said, you know, in the postgame that at halftime he said things he couldn't repeat here. And they came out with a lot more fire. You know, he shortened the bench. You know, Duran didn't have the approach that he wanted. He didn't play Duran in the second half. Some things that we didn't see as much earlier in the season. Um, and, you know, the, I know you didn't watch the broadcast. The comment was made on the broadcast that, you know, maybe next year Archie will have an easier time coaching that group, you know, perhaps because they'll be more cohesive or, you know, for whatever reason that might be. But he just, I don't know, he seemed really in tune with his team last night and every move that he made really seemed to help at least from a kind of motivation mindset standpoint. Did it, did you feel that way kind of in the building watching it? Yeah. I mean, I had a feeling that they were not going to play well early. I was more looking for, he did too. (laughs) Right. He knew that. I I, I just think it's natural um, to come out and, 
a situation like this and not being particularly enthusiastic about playing. I mean, there was stretches of great play and there were stretches of horrific play. I was more or less interested to see what they did in the second half. And to their credit, coaching staff's credit and the players' credit, they handled the second half uh, in a business-like manner where they took, you know, they they realized the situ- this is an inferior team. This is our home court. We're going to dominate them. And they did it. Uh, other than that, it's hard to really judge um, much off of a situation like this, but, but yeah. we'll see, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be real interested to see what happens um, on Saturday against yeah. Arkansas because Arkansas to me, the fact that they went to Providence and won, not saying that's a great win, but they didn't have their best player. To me, maybe some of those guys are thinking, well, we're more than Daniel Gafford. We want to show people that it's not just Daniel Gafford and Mike Anderson has been under a little bit of fire down there, I think, um, for wh- where that program stands. So uh, if if the players are kind of rallying around him, and I'm not saying he's in danger of getting fired or anything, but there's been some, obviously, some disappointment down there for how their season's gone, having a, a guy who's projected by many at the beginning of the season to be a top 15, top 20 pick and not really sniffing the tournament. I'll see what their – it'll be interesting to see kind of what their, their mentality is. It's actually going to be the second time this year that Arkansas comes to Assembly Hall because if you remember – yeah. They part as part of IU's agreement to go play it down there this year. Uh, they're getting a return game from Arkansas, uh, probably next November at some point. So, you know, it's it, it's going to be a step up in competition, and and we'll see how Indiana handles it. You know, I I, I wouldn't I I won't be surprised by any result in the NIT because it's it's Mm-mm. once you get past the first game, it's pretty easy not to care anymore. Um, it's pretty easy to to kind of say, all right, we've we've won a game and let's pack it in and, and it's all about at this point who wants to advance and if indiana wants to advance they can make it to new york and if they don't then their season will be over on saturday and you know it's going to be interesting because now you know you had a really quick turnaround for this game but now you've got you know three or four days you know four days in between games so you've got some time to kind of prepare you've also got some time to lose focus and this is <laughs> you know, a weekend on campus for anybody, you know, who went to school that can, you know, be a little fun, be a little loose. Um, so, you know, how focused, you know, is this group? I think we will learn a lot about that. And again, hopefully the fact that they lost to this team already helps keep them focused. And hopefully what we saw in the second half is a sign of a team that, you know, really doesn't want this season to end. Um, but again, recent NIT history suggests that if you're a number one seed, you better really, really be on guard in that second game because it has not gone well for number one seeds. And the last three seasons, the NIT has been won by a four seed. So Indiana needs to needs to come ready to play because Arkansas certainly seems like a team that will be ready to pick them off if they're not. But the Hoosiers that we saw in the second half certainly will be uh, much more ready to compete. Hopefully we see that for 40 minutes. Any final thoughts, Alex, before we wrap no i think i've talked more about the nit uh than i care to so well hopefully we have another week of talking about it you know we could have two weeks we could have two weeks so we'll we'll see how it goes um it was you know it's not a situation that you go i don't think anybody's excited to go to an nit game but i thought for the most part the fans that were there last night were awesome. And I thought, like I said, that to me, that's the biggest takeaway was the fact that people got a chance. There were so many kids there that I saw that just excited to be there. I mean, um, I was telling somebody last night, my son, the other night when he was watching the selection show and he was still holding out hope that they're going to make it. They didn't make it. And he cried. And I'm like, dude, they're still going to get a chance to play some more games. And of course he watched last night. He was excited about it. So it, it's, it's um you know it's it's you got to make the best of any situation as tough as it is and, and i thought for the most part everyone involved did last night so that mm. was cool another great lesson that uh, cynical adults can learn from kids when your team's playing a game just be there and be enthusiastic about it because you're right no one's right. excited about the nit but it's another chance to see indiana play basketball and that, that's one of the reasons i'm you know i'm so glad people were able to go to the game last night that didn't get a chance and that there were kids there that brings enthusiasm like you know, the, the, just felt like the people who were there really appreciated the opportunity to be there. And, you know, let, we're going to miss the season once it's gone. We're going to wish there was another game. So let's enjoy them as long as they're playing, even if the stakes aren't as high as we wanted them to be. It's still tournament basketball. So let's just go and win as many games as possible. Yep. 
Absolutely. That's what, I, that's what I have to say about it. All right. Well, thank you all for being here on Podcast on the Brink. We will be back next week with a new episode. We will have a post game show over on the Assembly Call Saturday uh, after the game. We hope you'll join us for that. And otherwise, have a great weekend. Enjoy the best weekend in sports, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Watch a lot of basketball, and we'll catch up on all of it next week on another edition of Podcast on the Brink. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!